Hello everyone, this is Dr. Lumley. It is Thursday, the day on which we were going to have class. Um, the weather has calmed down enough that I was able to get up here to my office and do this video among other things. I am doing this because I don't want to get behind too much in the syllabus. And I also don't want to leave out Matthew Arnold, who I am frankly sad we're not going to be talking about in person. Let me start, though, by making one last point about Middlemarch. So, if you would, turn, turn with me to chapter 80. This is one of the last ones that we discussed the other day, on Tuesday. <clears throat> Look at uh, the bottom of page 837, chapter 80. So if you will call, this is the night where Dorothea spends all night, uh, you know, lying on the floor, she wakes up, she has this uh, rejuvenated sense that I need to think about other people, not just myself. Um, she kind of gets back into Rosamond's frame of mind and the resolve to go and see her. So look at the bottom of 837. And what sort of crisis, last two lines, what sort of crisis might not this be in three lives whose contact with hers laid an obligation on her, as if they had been suppliants bearing the sacred branch. There might be a little Aeneid illusion there, but I'm not going to go into that right now. The objects of her rescue were not to be sought out by her fancy. They were chosen for her. She yearned towards the perfect right, capital R, that it might make a throne within her and rule her errant will. What should I do? How should I act now, this very day, if I could clutch my own pain and compel it to silence, and think of those three? It had taken long for her to come to that question, and there was light piercing into the room. She opened her curtains and looked out towards the bit of road that lay in view, with fields beyond, outside the entrance gates. On the road there was a man with a bundle on his back, and a woman carrying her baby. In the field she could see figures moving, perhaps the shepherd with his dog. Far off in the bending sky was the pearly light, and she felt the largeness of the world, and the manifold wakings of men to labor and endurance. She was a part of that involuntary, palpitating life, and could neither look out on it from her luxurious shelter as a mere spectator, nor hide her eyes in selfish complaining. What she would resolve to do that day did not yet seem quite clear. Okay, etc., etc. What are we seeing right there? Two things. One, she yearns to, she yearns towards the perfect right, capital R, which suggests an almost kind of divine sense here in this push to do excuse me, this push to do right by those who have been placed in her life, right? Um, right, these, are, these have been given to her. Um, they were not to be sought out by her fancy. They were chosen for her, right? So there's this sense that she has a mission, um, she has been, there, there's like some kind of providential sense of a calling here, um, something that has been chosen for her, or given to her, um, and, and, what, and her role to play here is to do right by those who have been placed in her life. This is some kind, something sacred, okay? And it's how does she do it? By engaging with those who have been given to her uh, by doing the good that, that lies nearest to her. Um, this is like really incarnated, even just visually, when she looks out the window and sees 
the, the, the man, the woman, uh, the baby out there in the field, she needs to love the one nearest to her, love her neighbor. And there she will meet this, uh, she will have, she can have this kind of transcendent, even divine experience. Um, so I think that's an important moment for, for Dorothea, a religious moment, I would even say. And it connects back to page 414. You may uh, or may not remember this. This is that brief conversation that Will and Dorothea have about their religion, right? And his religion is kind of a religion of beauty. <clears throat> like two-thirds of the way down, page 414. Dorothea's religion is really maybe five lines from the top of 414. Um, this, for the sake of clarity, is in chapter... 39. Um, she says, by desiring what is perfectly good, even when we don't quite know what it is and cannot do what we would, we are part of the divine power against evil, widening the skirts of light and making the struggle with darkness narrower. Okay, this is her sort of mystical religion of, of love and of loving the neighbor and through the neighbor, through the one that's nearest to you, um, having this kind of divine encounter. All right. So um, there isn't in Middlemarch a, a kind of religious world picture, right? A social faith and order that can perform the function of knowledge for the willing soul. As the, the prelude says, there is not like that's, that's in danger, right, in, in George Eliot's Victorian England. But she, in a way, in this novel, is trying to put out, um, <clears throat> put out another kind of semi-religious picture that can give meaning and bind us together, right? So in that, very similar to Carlyle, who was, after all, trying to do something similar in his own way. I think hers is more kind of attractive and and uh, uh, attractive and, and maybe successful picture than his, but you know they both sense that lack and are trying to fill the fill it. Um, okay, whatever you think about that, um, I just want to. I just think that's clarifying to to put uh, Middlemarch in those sort of semi-religious terms. Now, for the last. Um, turn on this topic. I want to actually move um, over the pond, not the pond, over the channel to Europe and hear the voice of probably an unexpected thinker to you. Um, this is the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who in his book, The Twilight of the Idols, had uh, some snarky comments about George Eliot, of all people. George Eliot, who was well known in Germany, she spent some years of her life there as an adult, had a lot of friends there, and, uh, you know, she did a lot of German translating in her life. You can look that up uh, sometime if you're interested. Well, <clears throat> in this book, The Twilight of the Idols, written 1888, so a good 15 years after Middlemarch. He writes this, under the heading G. Eliot. Quote, They are rid of the, of the Christian God and now believe all the more firmly that they must cling to Christian morality. That is an English consistency. We do not wish to hold it against little moralistic females a la Eliot. In England, one must rehabilitate oneself after every little emancipation from theology by showing in a veritably awe-inspiring manner what a moral fanatic one is. That is the penance they pay there. We others hold otherwise. When one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality out from under one's feet. This morality is by no means self-evident. 
This point has to be exhibited again and again, despite the English flatheads. Christianity is a system, a whole view of things, thought out together. By breaking one main concept out of it, the faith in God, one breaks the whole. Nothing necessary remains in one's hands. Okay, and then he ends this by saying, for the English, morality is not yet a problem. Right. Okay, so what is Nietzsche's point there in his typical provocative way? Remember that Nietzsche's uh, famous maxim is God is dead. Right? He proclaims the death of God, by which he means that um, God, not that not that God is literally dead, and so, but but that God is dead in in our minds, right, and in the minds of of Western Europe and so on. Um, this is the phenomenon we were looking at on the first day of class. So his thesis about Eliot is here: she loses her faith, um, as I think I said to you guys in class. She loses her faith, um, and yet she wants to retain Christian morality, right? This whole egoism and altruism thing, this whole uh, condemnation of pride on the one hand, and this promotion of love of the other, love of neighbor, which ends up being a pathway to God. Go back to the first day of class again. Remember um, that connection, that question of connection between me and all the people around me, uh, the individual and the community, and then also the connection between me and uh, the individual and God, right? In some mystical sense, through the other. Um, all of that, right, when you call God into question, you call the Christian God who reveals these truths into question, then Nietzsche is saying, hold on, you can't just have that moral system without its grounding um, it's grounding sort of texts in the Bible and their, and their authority. He's got a good point, right? <laughs> um, he is carrying this logic all the way to its natural end and holding it against George Eliot and some others, frankly, um, that we all read this semester, holding it against them that they don't take it far enough. Look, you can't just have have your morality that you were raised with without the foundations. Um, you can't have this ethics of love like George Eliot wants to without having a God of love that vouchsafes the, the meaning of love, right? And and so on and so forth. And 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 like the, the real efficacy of this. Okay. So he critiques her little mysticism that she is developing here. All right, on the one hand, I think he's right, and and we have to hear this, we have to feel that. Um, and, uh, and George Eliot, you know, needs to suffer that critique. On the other hand, one final response, and then we're going to move on to Matthew Arnold. I think the last thing that could be said vis-a-vis -vis Nietzsche is, sure, there is kind of a problem here of justification of, of the, the, uh, the ethics of love and the, this kind of uh, remnants of Christian morality that she, she cares too much about. It's too beautiful, too meaningful to let go of. She reaches out for it against, like e even uh, <laughs> it, in spite of the fact that she can't explain it, right? Um, I think... There is that, but on the other hand, there's something profound in the fact that she can't not reach out for it. You know what I mean? She can't let go of this vision of a life held together by love. Of a life held together by um, this, this transcendent experience of loving the other that somehow carries out beyond the other into this sacred, uh, this sacred space. That dynamic is not something that George Eliot can just let go of, even though she can't explain it. And, and I think so. So I think there in her, in her willingness 
to depict something that is inexplicable by her, right? That's bigger than she can explain, that um, she can't even quite justify. Her willingness to do that, I think you could say, um, is a courageous thing, actually, and a witness to an undying religious desire in the human soul. Um, Nietzsche is perhaps more logically uh, rigorous, but that's not all there is, right? There's also intuition. There's also the witness of the heart, which goes beyond the mind. The, as Pascal says, the, the, the heart knows things that the mind knows not of. And, and so George Eliot is putting her chips there, I think, in a way. Um, whatever Nietzsche might say to the contrary. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of extend that, that, that account a little bit further beyond what we were able to do last time. Now, Matthew Arnold. I'm going to say, quite frankly, this should have gone before George Eliot. It would have played better there. So let's just pretend that in some ways we're hearing a voice that um, that flows along nicely with the material we had before George Eliot. I think he's still good here, but you'll see what I mean. You can see what you think. So I want to do Dover Beach, and uh, I'm going to try to recite this, although I think it's a little rusty. I might screw it up a little bit. I might look down and check my text, but let's see what, let's see if I can do it. Okay. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. This is, uh, sorry, this is page 593 in our anthology. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only, where the, uh, only <laughs> where, the, where the sea meets the moon-blanched land. Listen, you can hear, I screwed that up. <clears throat> Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land. Listen, you can hear the the the, uh, the grating roar of pebbles that the right waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Again and uh, begin and cease and then again begin, bringing the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and into his mind it brought the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. And it, uh, we find also in this sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shores lay like the folds of a vast girdle furled. But now we only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar to the, uh, to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so beautiful, so, um, to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither love, nor joy, nor life, nor peace, nor, <laughs> nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Okay, sorry, that was extremely imperfect. But, um, <clears throat> but I tried. So I love this poem. I think there, it's not without f a few flaws, but I think it is a, a remarkably good poem in many ways, and, and just what it should be. Uh, in, in many ways. So let me just talk about this with you for a few minutes. And um, if you have any questions about it, we can address those at the beginning of class next time. So first of all, this is in an ode structure, uh, kind of the, 
the genre of it. It's iambic pentameter, but the line lengths are all of varying, um, you know, foot numbers. The C is calm tonight, first foot. Sorry, first line is three feet. The tide is full, the moon lies, the tide is full, the moon lies fair. So that's four feet upon the straits on the French, on, on, upon the straits on the French coast, the light, that's five. So it's kind of waxing and waning, different line lengths, but dominant iambic um, meter with, of course, many, many metrical substitutions. And then the, uh, the the verse paragraphs are of different lengths, right? So he wants it, this kind of structure, uh, uh, this kind of ode structure that's called, is very organic and, um, you know, can, can um, take, take sort of its own peculiar shape. It has, uh, it has a rhythm, but uh, it's not exceedingly rule governed. That might be important. All right, let's just go line by line a little bit. The sea is calm tonight, period. Um, three, three calm iams there at the start, which I think, you know, we hear that, that maybe that wave-like rhythm and smoothness. Um, the period at the end, the, uh, the, uh, um, the unenjammed kind of full stop line there, um, gives us also a sense of calm, peaceful closure. Next line, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. Their second line and jams into the third. <clears throat> and, and you can hear the moonlight reaching across the, the end of line two into line three, stretching into line three out onto the straits. I like that. Light lies fair upon the straits. On, this, on the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. I like this metrically too, on the French coast, right? You have a pairing of the Pyrrhic on the, right? Two unaccented syllables and then French coast, two stressed syllables, the spondy, Pyrrhic spondy, an old poetic trick, which um, makes one foot very light and then the following foot very heavy. Um, so that it's like, but a boom, boom, right? You rush into this uh, heavier part, which in this poem orally is uh, maps onto the French coast over there across, which we feel as a presence across the English Channel. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. Um, another enjammed line and, and an initial opening trochee in line four. Trochee, right, which is accent, uh, accented an unaccented syllable. And what that does is it leans into gleams, right? Um, we're expecting an iamb at the start of the line, but um but um but um but um right iams. But we get the gleams and it's gone, right? We get the lean into the first syllable, which makes um, that word and the light that it images punch out, right? in the punch out of the rhythm and and stick out to us so i'm just kind of pointing out at this point um some of the ways that the metrical variations um and and the kind of sound design the oral design of this poem communicate the things that it is talking about right. gleams and is gone the cliffs of england stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay I like this um, dactylic um, first foot glimmering. Um, it just sounds like what it is, onomatopoeia. Glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Nice parallelism there between those two halves of that line. So again, we're still in this very peaceful um, place. Now, second verse paragraph, things get a little bit more turbid, shall we say. Um, only from the long line of spray where the sea, sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease and then again begin. Love those lines. Um, 
So what do we see here? Only that opening stress, um, it's a, you know, it's another trochaic substitution right there at the, at the start, which grabs us by the lapels and, and pivots, right? Because only is also um, a, a kind of contrastive conjunction in this case. And, and so we're making a distinction. Um, because we had the peaceful first, first um, section, first stanza, or really a verse paragraph, and then pivoting to a different angle now for this second. From the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land. I love that second line because you have the, it's bound together, the, the, the words, the syllables are bound together by assonance and alliteration. Sea meets, right? The, uh, the rhyme there, the internal rhyme, connects the two words one to another. Sea sticks to meets. And then meets alliterates with moon. So meets connects to moon. And then blanched and land also have that internal uh, assonance. And so each part of this, each part of this uh, line is sort of connected by one sound or another, which makes sense because we're talking about the meeting of sea and land, both of which are colored by moon, right? So um, I just I just think it's uh, it's very artfully done. Aural mm, sensation, or, you know, sense picture of what we're looking at. Listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles, which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. <laughs> okay, so we get sort of grandiose there at the end. The eternal note of sadness. I thought these were just waves. Um, most people don't go to the beach and think, ah, the eternal note of sadness. Um, but he does. This grating roar of pebbles is grating on him, right? And, and, is, and is, tr is sad in some way. What? is the key what to this sadness what uh in these lines identifies what is sad about it it's actually you know a little bit counterintuitive at first uh we're, we're so peaceful and beautiful so far but i think we get one sense from that line okay the grating roar grating has pejorative sounds but still why does like the pebbles like why is that a problem why does that equal sadness <clears throat> well, I think line 12 from my mind is the, is the key to it. The, so these waves begin and cease and then again begin. Um, first of all, here's a $10 um, pro, prosody word for you. Begin and, then, and cease and then again begin. Beginning the line and ending the line with the same word, which is ironically begin here, is called epanalepsis. That's E-P-A-N-A-L-E-P-S-I-S, -E epanalepsis. And here that figure of speech <clears throat> gives us this sense of the endlessness of the cycle, right? It's that kind of ceaseless round of, of, uh, of motion that the waves are... Um, some, that, that they're subjecting uh, the pebbles to. That, some, that circularity somehow is the problem. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that's what makes him feel sad. And again, we have to think about this because mo many people go to the beach, they don't feel sad because of the circularity of the waves. <laughs> okay, so why would circularity be a problem? Because you don't want circularity. At some level, at some level, you want onwardness, you want directionality, you want a telos, a purpose that you're driving towards that, uh, that transcends the cycles of life, right? Um, so I think I'm already kind of uh, signaling what I think this means, but, but I think of it really in terms of that that dynamic I put on the board on the first day of class. 
that kind of crisis of teleology. Um, Arnold is really, in all of his poems, interested in both of those problems I put up on the board on the first day of class. My connection to other people, right? What is the relationship between the individual and the community, not to mention God? Like, very much probably aware. This is another uh, guy who's lost his faith, um, uh, his childhood faith. You can see this very clearly in the stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse that we read for today. Okay, anyway, so he's very much interested in that kind of like, what is my what is my connection to other people? Um, also, Into Marguerite continued very much about, like, how is my island connected to the other islands? You know, it's, it's right there on the surface. Um, okay, but then also that, that question of teleology, uh, of action, of the meaning of my life, where am I going, who am I becoming, etc. That's clearly here. The waves remind him here in stanza two that his life isn't going anywhere. It's just repeating day after day. And the repetition of days start to seem like one damn thing after another if there's not, uh, if there's not a purpose, right? If there's not an arc that my life traces. Does that make sense? So I think that's a big part of the eternal note of sadness. It's a sadness at meaninglessness or purposelessness. All right. Make sure I'm not overstaying my welcome here. All right. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. Well, um... <laughs> Just you can uh, you can enjoy Harold Bloom's saucy footnotes on the pathetic qualities of Matthew Arnold. He he has a kind of um, gentle contempt for Arnold here and there. And as I said, I think I mean before, he'll also have strong feelings about Hopkins for different reasons. So you can enjoy it, laugh, and then and then move on. He he's too hard on Arnold. I for my money. And certainly Hopkins. <clears throat> but, um, so he's connecting his, this to Sophocles. As the footnote says, it's hard to tell what in Sophocles he's really thinking of here. Sophocles was not, you know, uh, Sophocles did not have the same problem that Matthew Arnold does because he hasn't lost any faith in God, Sophocles. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he's looking back to this kind of paganism and definitely identifying his own his own self and his age with a kind of neo-pagan moment. But we should never forget that neo-paganism can never be the same as paganism itself because there is in paganism, like in kind of the old pre-Christian paganism, there's not that kind of um, sense of the divine absence that you get in a Matthew Arnold. Um, all of the things that God is associated with, George Eliot, I think, shows us this really clearly. All the things that God is associated with in moral life, in spiritual life, in psychology, and so on and so forth, uh, cannot be easily forgotten. Right? Um, that they weren't there in that in quite that that full um, aching way before, for Sophocles anyway. But he's still kind of you know uniting them or trying to associate them. So what do we hear by this distant northern sea? That's what he moves on to in the second to last stanza. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a vast girdle furled. I love that. That image and, and those the rhythm of those lines is really, I think, regal. What is suggested... Um, well, so, let's see, a sea of faith with once two at the full and round earth shore. So we have these two enjambed lines, right? Because the sea of faith is stretching out over these lines orally, right? Um, and uh, and just kind of moving quickly on through the line endings. Um, really like one long three-line um, phrase. 
Okay, what is suggested, though, by the girdle metaphor? Um, sea of faith is a kind of clothing while it can be taken off, right? It's not essential. It is, uh, it is artificial in some way. There again, <laughs> it could be drawn back on. It, it is suggested, right? Uh, this is a tidal kind of sea metaphor, after all. Uh, and tides go out, they come back. Uh, people tend to put clothes back on again. <laughs> uh, and so, right, right now, the sea of faith is gone. What is the next step going to be? You can tell, uh, again, stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, Arnold is always looking forward to what is the next thing going to be. Is there going to be another religion? I'm I'm, I'm aching for something, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, waiting for whatever it can be. I don't know what it's going to be. I, you know, I can't go back to whatever we used to have. But what will the next thing be? You know, very much that kind of Carlisle uh, problem. You can, you can associate George Eliot here, too, in her own way. All right. But now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Love that. Love those lines. Final um, kind of culminating stanza. Ah, love, let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams. So various, so beautiful, so new. Hath really neither love nor joy, nor hath really neither joy nor love nor light, nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain, and we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Okay, so we're in a dream world. Um, interesting connections there to some things we like. <laughs> I'm just remembering Rosamond's dream dream world that she's in but i think this is a little different we're in a dream world where which looks various beautiful and new but but then you have so you have three good um adjectives there but then the next two lines give us six things that that world does not have right so the bads the the negatives uh far you know doubly outweigh the positives and uh this is a world in which Appearance does not match reality. Appearance will, appearance will not, the world will not give you what it appears to give you. It does not give you what it promises. So there's a kind of deep, there's a kind of elegiac um, sense of loss there, but also of, of kind of tragic betrayal, uh, betrayal of the appearances and of the desires. And we are here as on a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. So we end with a night battle, which makes us think of what? Sermon 10 by John Henry Newman. This is why we should have read this, of course, right after Newman and before Eliot. Um, Arnold, as I said, was an undergraduate in Newman's time and seems to have actually, I mean, he, we know he attended uh, one or two of John Henry Newman's university sermons in the pulpit of the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin right on uh, Broad Street in Oxford. He seems to, he's left records of having been there. Well, one of the other reasons that that seems uh, likely and, and uh, is this uncanny echo of the end of Sermon 10 where Newman is saying, I'm trying to remember the precise words, um, our battle is fought now not between St. Michael on one side and the demons uh, on the other, but, um, but, is, uh, but, but, but between, um, but it's a night battle, right? Um, where we don't know whether we're fighting friend or foe or not, right? And we, this is why, so for, so for Newman, like how does that all hang together? Uh, also, there's the Thucydides kind of illusion behind, behind both of those that I mentioned in class. How does that work? Well, recall that for Newman, um, in this fragmented modern world without a common myth and a common sort of set of, it's common faith is his word, 
to do a uh, hold us together um, that <clears throat> people are using people are using words but they're not, they're not meaning common things by those words and so we have to define it and figure out what we're really meaning at the bottom so we shop passing one another and we can actually figure out what the real divides are uh, and so Newman is kind of registering tragically at the end of that sermon this this kind of breakdown of common culture and common faith um, that undergirds your you know one's sense of what is reasonable okay Eliot very much in that same world as we saw from the prelude on there's no um, social faith and culture which can uh, which can um, uh, perform the function of knowledge for the willing soul, for the ardent soul. And, and um, so for Arnold, um, so for Newman rather, that means that we're often fighting with one another when we might actually agree with one another, right? We might have this faith, this common faith. We don't know it because we, um, because we can't take for granted who the other person is anymore. Um, and we might, we might actually disagree or agree. It's just not clear. There's so much confusion um, in this divided, fragmented world. Arnold sees the same thing. And, uh, and yet for Arnold, it's much more tragic because for Newman, there, there is a, there's a, a possibility of, of finding wholeness and of finding how everything fits together. Uh, there's a possibility of a true faith, in other words. Whereas for Arnold, he's not sure that there is one, right? Uh, he's lost the faith that he had. The sea of faith has withdrawn. Um, and we're fighting each other at night. There's a kind of chaos about this. Is it ever going to return to the way we feel that it should be? Not clear, right? So for him, he seizes on this image from Newman and feels the... Uh, feels the suggestive darkness of it, doesn't have a, a way of faith out of it like Newman does, right? So, so um, I think a really kind of interesting, important connection there for our class. Now, I've been talking for 42 minutes so far. I want to just make a couple of points about the buried life, maybe five, ten minutes here at the end, and we will... Um, we will be done in, I think, under an hour for this lecture. Okay, The Buried Life. It's on the next page. Um, this, um, I, the footnote probably tells you this, but this poem has a lot of um, illustrious predecessors in romantic poetry. I'm thinking especially of Coleridge's Kubla Khan, which also has to do with an underground river. But I'm going, to, I'm going to leave that out for now. Okay, first stance. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to touch on several things. First um, verse paragraph. Light flows our wor war of mocking words, and yet, behold, with tears mine eyes are wet. I feel a nameless sadness o'er me roll. Yes, yes, we know that we can jest. We know, we know that we can smile. But there's a something in this breast to which thy light words bring no rest, and thy gay smiles no anodyne. Give me thy hand and hush a while, and turn those limpid eyes on mine, and let me read there, love, thy inmost soul. Okay, so there's a sadness, again, in this poem, which has something to do with the divide between surface and depth. The surface where they have these light banter, these words, these war of mocking words, um, and gay smiles, but they don't get down to that something in the breast. And so the speaker here is looking at the beloved and wanting to read in her eyes the, her soul, right, which is somehow missing in those, those superficial words. So we're getting that doubleness. Um, keep going. And, and also, light words that bring no rest. There's that kind of Augustinian restlessness. Second stanza. Alas, is even love too weak to unlock the heart and let it speak? 
Are even lovers powerless to reveal to one another what indeed they feel? I knew the mass of men concealed their thoughts for fear that if revealed they would be uh, they would by other men be met with blank indifference or with blame reproved. I knew they lived and moved, tricked in disguises, alien to the rest of men and alien to themselves. And yet the same heart beats in every breast, every human breast. So the interesting thing here is most people, most of the time, conceal their thoughts from others, right? We look around at other people in the world. Do you just kind of bear it all to everybody normally? No, you, you, you uh, protect, you uh, wall off and... Um, okay, understandably, you can't bury your soul to everyone, but he's reacting here to, um, well, especially in the next stanza, right, to the fact that even lovers, right, even people who are very close are necessarily alienated from one another. This is the, sad, the source of sadness. We can't, even those of us who are really close to one another, somehow can't get across to the other person. Um, there's this kind of alienation, this, this inviolability of the self that you can't get out and, and get to the other. Um, so, so again, think of that, the problem of the self and the other, or the individual and the community, right, that we've been talking about. Um, and then, even more, line 20, I knew they lived and moved, tricked in disguises, alien to the rest of men and alien to themselves. We're even alienated from ourselves. We don't even really know what's going on in ourselves. Whatever we think about poor Matthew Arnold and his own dilemmas and the Victorian dilemmas, this is, there's something true about this, right? We're a mystery unto ourselves, just like, and, and there's, of course, something impossible about the path to the other also. Okay, so he's setting up this problem. But we, my love, you know, are we like this too, the lover and the beloved? Um, let's see. Uh, so, so he comes to his diagnosis in line 30. Fate, which foresaw how frivolous a baby man would be, by what distractions he would be possessed, how he would pour himself in every strife and well nigh change his own identity, that it might keep from his capricious play his genuine self and force him to obey, even in his own despite, his being's law. Bade through the deep recesses of our breast, the unregarded river of our life, pursue with indiscernible flow its way. Um, so what does fate do exactly? There's a long um, relative clause there. Fate, which foresaw X, Y, and Z, does what? It bades, or it bids, through the deep recesses of our breast flow the unregarded river. So fate separates us from the river of our life, whatever that is, this kind of sense of flow or directionality uh, of, my, of my heart or of my inner life. Fate separates my conscious awareness from that inward flow. That's kind of the fundamental action which this poem settles on or, or proposes as having happened somehow somewhere why and this is where the long relative clause the long which clause comes fate sees or foresees how frivolous we can be that we would pour ourselves into every strife and well nigh change our own identities um, that it might keep from his capricious play his genuine self and force him to obey even in his own despite his being's law Fate seems to see that if we really knew who we really were, where, where our life was going, we would violate it in some way, right? We would be too flippant with it, that it's too precious, actually, to give us uh, full and immediate access to. That's interesting, right? And maybe there's something true about that, right? Uh, maybe there's something, actually, for our own good about the... The, the separation from, uh, like, from the depths of our directionality or our drive, our teleological orientation. Um, that's at least what he's saying. I think there's, there's something interesting about that. Okay, so we got this underground river inside of us. <laughs> um, 
which is unregarded, which we are usually unaware of. Um, this is, and so I, I think I said this already, Kubla Khan by Coleridge has this image of an underground river, uh, which has some very similar connotations. All right, so um, this is pursuing its indiscernible flow. And there we, um, and there, and that we should not see that the buried stream and seem to be eddying at large in blind uncertainty, though driving on with it eternally. Okay, so we got this indiscern this this river. But often in the world's most crowded streets, and often in the in the din of strife, there rises an unspeakable desire after the knowledge of our buried life, a thirst to spend our fire and restless force in tracking out our true original course. A longing to inquire into the mystery of this heart, which beats. Okay. So at the at the core of Arnold's diagnosis of modern man is we have this aching Augustinian, we can say, desire for um, for meaning and purpose and uh, and for a, a kind of direction uh, for a point to our story. Right, a place to be that we're going, a, a person that we're becoming, and all of that um, can't let go of that. But we also uh, don't have any easy answers about where it is, right? Where 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 it is that we're going? He's affirming the presence of a direction within us, but saying we just it's um, it's been hidden from us. <clears throat> uh, and yet the desire witnesses to it profoundly, right? You can't forget that desire. In a way, this is of like a, of a piece with George Eliot, right? Who uh, does not wholeheartedly embrace a kind of doctrinal solution, yet she nevertheless wants to affirm and hold tight to this kind of mystical sense of, of directionality, right? Arnold is in a kind of similar position in this poem, I think. All right. So when can like how what chance do we have of getting a glimpse of this uh, this inner river? Next stanza. And long we try in vain to speak and act our hidden self, and what we say and do is eloquent, is well, but tis not true. So we have this sense of inauthenticity, like I'm doing saying all this stuff, but is this really the point of my life? <laughs> that kind of midlife crisis uh, thing that we know well, but I mean, it probably it's, oh, it still hasn't happened to you guys, but that sense of phoniness that I'm doing and saying all this stuff, all the light banter of my life. What is the point of all this? Is it really, does it really have anything to do with where I'm going? Um, <clears throat> okay. So how do we ever get there? Next paragraph, um, next next stanza. Only, but this is rare, when a beloved hand is laid in ours, when, jaded with the rush and glare of the interminable hours, our eyes can in another eyes read clear, when our world-deafened ear is by the tones of a loved voice caressed, a bolt is shot back somewhere in our breast, and a lost pulse of feeling stirs again. The eye sinks inward, and the heart lies plain, and what we mean we say and what we would, we know. A man becomes aware of his life's flow and hears its winding murmur, and he sees the meadows where it glides, the sun, the breeze. So when does it happen? When a beloved hand is laid in ours. We have this momentary contact with the, the other in love. In those moments, you can have this flashing sense of directionality and meaning and purpose, and we could even say, uh, you know, of a kind of divinity, right? Like, where does the where does the river flow? It flows towards the sea in the last line, right? Which has al always this kind of transcendent, um, you know, divine telos association with it. You can get a sense of that, and of that, of that, um, of that, through or in moments. Uh, passing moments of love uh, on, on earth, you know, a creaturely love, love, love of the other, love of neighbor, 
and so on. It's especially romantic in this context, in this, in this poem. You can see how this would also connect to the beloved and the rhetoric of the beloved in, uh, in Dover Beach. That's not enough, I can hear you saying, right? <laughs> like having these little flashes of meaning that may or not be real or whatever. But it's not nothing, okay? And I would say to you, this is still one possibility for a way to understand our life and rediscover transcendence that's still with us today. You know, the end of many, many uh, <laughs> Hollywood movies has to do with this, right? Not, not having a sense of how it all hangs together. Uh, this is a dark time. Hold my hand. And, and in that moment of, or, or, you know, or kiss me. And in that moment of human contact, I get a flash of something and that's all I'm going to get. Is that entirely unreal? Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, uh, we don't have to decide on that, but I think there's something real about that. I do. Um, maybe it's not enough, but it's something. And, and you, and I, again, as I've said before in this class, want to take seriously Matthew Arnold's desire for this fulfillment um, uh, and his reaching, like the, the strain of his reaching out for an answer, for a solution, for a way to have some piece of, of what he feels himself to be lacking. Okay, and then we end with the, the, the shorter lines of the last first paragraph and that intuition of a place of rest, um, which I don't see, but I, but I desire, and, uh, and I am just holding on to that channel of desire. Okay, that's enough for today. I uh, hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you guys next Tuesday to talk about I believe Walter Pater and Gerard Manley Hopkins.